Welcome to The Good Word. My name is Vincent Goodwill, Senior NBA Reporter for Yahoo Sports. We are part of the Ball Don't Lie podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. We got a couple of guests today, but before we jump into those conversations, there's some news items that we have to tackle uh, because the finals have ended. There's some hirings, firings, free agency, all that type of stuff. So let's get right into it. Uh, first off, just came across this morning the Twitter machine or whatever we call Twitter nowadays. Uh, the Cavs hiring Kenny Atkinson. Kenny, of course, spent a number of years with Golden State after three plus years with the Brooklyn Nets leading into the, you know, Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, all that stuff. So he spent a couple of years in Golden State. I'm going to say licking his wounds, but he's been figuring some stuff out. And the Cavs are in such an interesting spot right now because, for one, you have the Donovan Mitchell situation where he can sign an extension with the Cavs. Or if he chooses not to, it will, of course, be a signal that he wants out. It seems like all the things that we've been hearing up until this point has been it's very likely to happen, assuming they get the right coach. And if they've, they're they hiring Kenny Atkinson and they feel pretty confident about it, especially if Dan Gilbert, which has been reported by The Athletic, Dan Gilbert has been spearheading this coaching search or spearheading the flip-flop from James Borrego being the leading candidate to now Kenny Atkinson taking over. Maybe he knows something that the rest of us do not. Now, I also think that Ownership getting involved and basically changing the direction of coaching searches, not always the most positive thing as evidence because I live in Detroit and I'm sure as I will touch on a little bit later, you know, Monty Williams, record contract, seem to be sort of directed by Tom Gores and not by Troy Weaver, who's no longer there because of all the, the situations and everything that happened there. And it's, it just makes for a messy thing. It makes for very, very, I won't say unclean, but it just makes for a very tricky situation because you're wondering now, is the coach going to be answering to the general manager in the front office or is the coach going to be answering to the owner? The power structure in these situations become very murky and muddy. Now, not just Donovan Mitchell, they have to figure out. They also have to figure out how do we best utilize and develop Evan Mobley. For those who have listened to this podcast, I've been here. If you want to sell your Evan Mobley stock, give it to me. I'll take it. I'm still on Evan Mobley Island. I still think that he is going to be as impactful. Maybe just it's going to be a look a little bit different. He hasn't put on a lot of weight. He hasn't developed a three-point shot. I'm not sure he will or if he has to. But with the composition of the roster with Jared Allen being there, He's had to be the guy to try to take steps out. I wonder if the roster will look completely different, especially when you consider Darius Garland being there, playing with Donovan Mitchell, and then you got the two big guys or two at least two tall guys and Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. I still believe in Mobley at least turning into a real bona fide all-star type of big. So that's what Kenny Atkinson is going to inherit. And of course, this will wind up setting off a domino effect getting to Detroit. But before we get to Detroit, we got to go to LA because the Lakers, to the surprise of no one, hired J.J. Redick from ESPN, ABC. Did, uh, he's the color analyst during the NBA Finals. He, of course, did the Mind the Game podcast with LeBron James, which seemed to set off all types of bells, whistles, and alarms. Hey, what's going on here? Then, of course, there was that real interesting uh, Dan Hurley courtship, and now they circle back to J.J. Redick, who's had no coaching experience outside of, you know, coaching maybe his kid's AAU team, a couple of years retired. I do think that J.J. Redick is really smart. I do think that J.J. Redick at least commands the attention of LeBron James. But we all know that LeBron has played for a bunch of different coaches that we all thought that he liked or had great relationships with going in. And then because coaching LeBron James and coaching the Lakers put you in a pressure cooker, you don't know how this stuff is going to turn out. I do know this. I don't know if J.J. Redick can coach. I don't know if it matters if he can coach or not, to be perfectly honest. 
if they don't fix that roster, if they don't answer some very critical questions here, it doesn't matter whether J.J. Redick is equipped enough. Like, I don't have to get into, I know some people have said it looked like he was undermining Darvin Ham by starting the podcast. We don't even have to get into that. By and large, you can make the case that you can fire at least over half of the coaches in the league if you want to. You can keep over half the coaches in the league if you want to. It's a matter of the lens in which you view it. And because the Lakers saw themselves as being a team that got to the Western Conference Finals the year before and found themselves getting waxed in the first round this year, and you got to see Anthony Davis, he didn't seem to really connect with Darvin Ham. I won't say he outwardly threw him under the bus, but if Darvin Ham was laying in the street and Anthony Davis was driving the bus, it didn't seem like he was moving out the way. So now you got to have a guy in J.J. Redick who commands the respect and attention of both LeBron James and Anthony Davis, in addition to the fact that it's likely or it feels likely they're going to draft Ronnie James. Can you do all of those things? Can you get LeBron's guy to come coach the team? Can you sign LeBron's son or draft LeBron's son and still do all those things, accomplish all those objectives, and still consider yourselves a championship franchise? I'm not sure if you can accomplish all those objectives. You got the D'Angelo Russell question. You got a bunch of other roster questions that I don't know if signing a coach or swapping out coaches is going to change. In addition to, is Anthony Davis going to get any better? Not to say that Anthony Davis isn't great, but I'm saying if he's not getting better than what he was this season, when he had a hell of a year, when he was on my not only all defensive ballot, but he was, I think he was third or second on my defensive player of the year ballot. If he's not a better version than the outstanding version that he was this year, how good can you be with the roster is currently constructed? Because can you expect LeBron to play more games? LeBron will be 40 years old this year, y'all. 40. And I know we tend to think that LeBron is indestructible. I know we 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 think that. We think that he's just going to continue to play forever. Right. Give you the last few years. He played 71 games this past season. That was the most that he's played in a Laker uniform, not counting the COVID shortened 2019, 2020 season. He played 56, 56 games and 22. He played 55 games the year before 71. Do we anticipate that he's going to continue to play and be available at these at this high number? I'm not sure. It's just you find it very difficult to see that continuing because he's going to be 40 years old, all the tread on his tires. And then you add J.J. Redick there. He's never coached before, as we said. He's very intelligent, very smart, but you also have to worry about how he's going to command respect in the locker room and people are saying or looking around and saying, LeBron hired you. So the, once again, do we answer to LeBron or do we answer to J.J. Redick? It's a very tricky situation in L.A. because it's always a tricky situation in L.A. because that's how they do things over there. Now, speaking of tricky situations, I reside in Detroit. And the Detroit Pistons, after seemingly weeks and months of letting Monty Williams twist in the wind, you know, they fired him on Juneteenth. Now, you can say that, hey, a black man got his freedom on Juneteenth and got a pretty big check to go along with it. But I think he anticipated being able to coach this team this coming year with a reconfigured roster and a new front office and Trajan Langdon and he who was Trajan Langdon is the new president of basketball operations for the Pistons. It was probably, you know, there was a lot of meetings that both of those guys had with each other to see if this, you know, relationship could continue. And it seemed from the people that I've talked to that it was coming out to three things three scenarios, rather, that the Pistons could have taken with Monty Williams and that exorbitant contract now that they will owe him, you know, $65 million over the balance of that contract. You ho you would hope, if you're a Pistons fan, that that $65 million doesn't prohibit Tom Gores to from signing guys in free agency. All the cap stuff notwithstanding, just the fact that you got a $65 million arbitrage hanging over your head, that that doesn't prevent you from doing everything on the floor that you need to do to upgrade the
the roster on the floor, the product on the floor. Now, the three options were they would continue forward with Monty Williams as head coach, and not just for this year, but through the life of this entire enterprise, right? So you're just, just going to fully commit to Monty Williams. The second option was we're going to give Monty Williams a year, right? We're going to give him another year, chop some more money off of that contract, and see what happens there. See if he connects better with players. See if we get better players around him. See if he's a better fit with the roster. He clearly was not a good fit with the roster. That was all of, of the, the thoughts. Hey, does Monty want to be here? Is Monty fully invested here? That question was posed from pretty much the moment that he agreed to become Pistons coach. And it was reinforced when they had that 28-game losing streak, which began on the third game of the season, right? Never forget that that long, drawn-out, and, and depressing losing streak began in the third game of the season. So it, it sapped whatever hope that you thought you had going into the season to begin with, okay? So that was option two, was just giving him a year and seeing if things could work out better. And then option three was firing him. And they chose option three, which allows Trajan Langdon to come in and assert his vision and to presumably hire his head coach. I say presumably because there's always this thought in Detroit about many cooks in the kitchen. There's always this thought of, and he talked a little bit about it during his introductory press conference last Friday. There's always this thought in Detroit with Arn Tellum, super agent, now Pistons vice chairman Arn Tellum in the fold, who has final say? Who's the boss? And Tom Gores lives in L.A. So because he's not physically in the building and around, that gives people more responsibility, more say. Arn Tellum is an alternate governor. He is someone who's, a, like I said, a vice chairman. He has more influence than many would assume. There were a lot of different things going on in that building last year. As a source told me at Yahoo, for, for Yahoo Sports on a column I wrote last week, four different factions in that building. Four. And that's not entirely uncommon in the NBA where, you know, the owner's going to think something, the GM's going to think something, the coach is going to think something. But when you're winning 14 games, everybody needs to be rolling in the same direction. And that hasn't happened. So with your Trajan Langdon, and as I reported in that column, James Borrego was the was one of the first names that came out once they decided that they were going to move on from Monty Williams. James Borrego was in the running for the Cleveland job that went to Kenny Atkinson. So now he's available. It seems like he would be a fit with the Pistons. I do have questions, though, sometimes about, hey, can you relate to players? Do players believe in you? Do players buy into you? Those are always questions that I have when sometimes – a coach comes from a lose one losing situation to another losing situation. Is it culture? Is it is it you? I got all types of questions. Not saying it would be a bad hire if it happened, but it's just one of those things because the Pistons seem like that they're going to go through a very judicious process here. They're not going to hire a coach before the draft. I'm just very curious if he's the guy, what that actually looks like. This will be some of those young guys. You got Cade Cunningham and Jalen Duran and Isaiah Stewart if he's there and Jaden Ivey. This will be their third coach in three years, from the last year of Dwayne Casey to Monty Williams and everything that came with that to whomever they're going, they're going to hire this year. Remember last year before the Monty Williams hiring happened, Troy Weaver, who was then the general manager, he initially wanted to hire Kevin Alley, who wound up being in the interim spot in Brooklyn, taking a, a high-level assistant job there before they had coaching upheaval, and he wound up getting an opportunity, but it didn't work out there. Arn Tellum wanted to hire Jaron Collins. That was one of his former clients who has spent time with Golden State. This time, I think Collins will, will be involved. Also, Dave Yeager, who used to coach, you know, the Memphis Grizzlies, Sacramento Kings, like a veteran guy. I would not be surprised. I would say don't be surprised if you see Dave Yeager's name around here. Around these parts. There's other guys I think the Pistons should consider guys who've been in their building before. You know, a guy like Jerome Allen, who been, who's been on the staff. He spent this season with the Boston Celtics. He interviewed last year, but I don't think it gained much traction. But I do think some of these guys need to have some level of familiarity, some level of continuity. This is a critical summer for the franchise where you have a guy 
like Kay Cunningham, who's eligible to sign a $220 plus million max extension on his rookie deal. And usually those things kind of go without being said. You know, number one pick, even if the team hasn't performed, Kay Cunningham has performed, usually guys like that get the max and you try to figure out stuff around him. Also, you won 14 games last year. I don't know how much more how much you can say, hey, you've affected winning. So I wonder if there's going to be some haggling there. I anticipate there might not be. You you get the guy, you take, you give him his money, and you try to move on. Now, for Trajan Langdon, the rebuild is a weird one because you've got young pieces, you've got young players, but you're coming in off the heels of another rebuild. This franchise has not won a playoff game in 16 years. Teams are going through rebuilds and reloads and everything else while the Pistons have been pretty much trying to figure things out, whether it's throwing money at Monty Williams or trying to get Blake Griffin or whatever it is. Like, Gores has resources, but it hasn't worked out. So if you're Trajan Langdon, you don't want to be in a spot where you're starting over, but you also don't want to be in a spot where you have 16 years hanging over your head. You have to start this job from day one as if it is day one. And he said, hey, look, as opposed to signing guys to overvalued deals in this new salary cap reality, hey, how about we will take on draft picks and bad contracts from previous CBA? We can do that. That's kind of what the Brooklyn Nets did to get themselves out of salary cap hell when they were out of draft picks because of the Kevin Garnett, Paul Pierce trade that wound up getting the Boston Celtics, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Like that's kind of what Brooklyn did when they said, hey, we're going to take on the bad contract and give us the pick. Take on the bad ch- contract, give us the pick. And then you try to flip those picks later. And you hope those players, although overpaid, are still valuable. I would not be surprised if the Pistons did something similar to that. In large part because you have Kay Cunningham and you're anticipating him being on a five-year max, that will kick in next season if he does it. So the clock will be ticking from the moment he signs that extension, which means you can't go through an elongated process of things here. Now, Speaking of elongated processes, we got the Chicago Bulls. We got the Oklahoma City Thunder, right? Alex Caruso, who was the apple of everyone's eye, an all-defensive type player, a guy who people really believe will change good teams to championship type teams. That's the type of player that they think he is. Oklahoma City got him for Josh Giddy. It was clear that Josh Giddy had to go from Oklahoma City, right? The Bulls are clearly looking at Josh Gideon saying he's got room to improve. He's a creative passer. He's a good defender. And we have issues at the point guard spot because Lonzo Ball is there. We're not sure what Lonzo Ball's future is going to be. And clearly, if you're signing and trading for Josh Giddy, it is clear the way the Bulls think about Lonzo Ball, who would be entering the fourth year of that contract that he signed with the Bulls as a free agent. But he's missed all of last year, most of the year before, with a really unfortunate leg injury remember the whole you know he's unable to walk so he got in front of a pool and stood up and sat down and stood up and sat down to prove that all the reports about him not being able to walk were false Duff protest too much to some degree in that way but the Bulls clearly are trying to move on from Lonzo Ball they're also trying to move on from Zach Levine who they signed to a five-year 215 million dollar max last year he clearly in the front office aren't necessarily aligned or he and Billy Donovan aren't aligned. He had surgery that ended the season. There was rumors about him being traded up until the trade deadline when he decided and elected to have surgery. Those talks will continue. I would not be surprised if something developed over the next few days. The Bulls are very anxious to get off of him. I'm a little surprised that the Bulls did not get more draft capital for Alex Caruso, considering how coveted he was around the league. And maybe Maybe Oklahoma City just pulls Jedi mind tricks. Maybe that's just what it is. They they have all their picks, and they didn't want to give up a damn pick to get off of Josh Giddy. And I felt like to get off of Josh Giddy and everything that he had going on, you guys can go look it up. There was accusations of him having an underage relationship with a minor. It was investigated, and it could not be corroborated. And every time he touched the ball in a gym somewhere, he was roundly booed. And he just didn't fit with Oklahoma City because with Shea Gilgis Alexander and Jalen Williams and Lou Dort, they needed someone who could space the floor. Defensively, he fit, but offensively, they were really gummed up. And you saw it in that playoff series against the Dallas Mavericks. And that was one of the reasons why Dallas was able to overtake them. Oklahoma City also is in a spot where they're going to have to make 
financial decisions over the next couple of years because as well as they've drafted, not just Chet Holmgren, but, you know, bringing Shea over and Shea's on the max. You got to figure out what you're going to do with J-Dub. You got to figure out what you're going to do with Blue Door. I think J-Dub is going to be the guy. Like That's like Kawhi Light, which means you're going to have to pay him, which means Oklahoma City, we all know, they live in a different financial world than the rest of the NBA. They're not going into luxury tax territory. They've got those draft picks for a reason. So you're not sure if who they're going to keep, who they're going to hold on to, but you know Chet Holmgren is a keeper, and you know Shea Gilgis Alexander is a keeper, and you know that Jalen Williams is a keeper. The question is how do you fit all those things around them in a very competitive Western Conference? Getting a guy like Alex Caruso is a step towards more relevancy, more playoff-like experience, so to speak, where he doesn't scare, he's going to make some shots, and he's going to defend and be very scrappy. I like that, especially not having to give up anything of the draft picks. Now, now that we get those stories out of the way, let's get into our NBA draft preview with our draft, Nick, Kristen Peak. Joining me today is our draft expert, Kristen Peak. KP, are you still stressing over this week or have you started to calm down a little bit? No, you know what it is, Vinny, and I use this analogy uh, for another interview I did. It's like I spend all year, all season, all college season, whatever, and then sometimes a year plus getting to know these players, scouting these players. And then the two weeks leading up to the draft, it's like a final exam. You're up at midnight crunch time and everyone is just trying to know as much as possible about these players. So I feel great. I I was talking to an executive and he said, oh, how do you feel about going into this draft week? And I was like, amazing. I'm not the one making the picks. So I'm doing just fine. I mean, I just filed my last mock draft. Uh, there's going to be a few other stories coming out this week. But with such a weird draft with so much uncertainty, I kind of love it. I think there's going to be organized chaos on draft night. And the fact that it's now a two-night draft, there's 24 Green room invites, Vinny. I think we're going to be seeing a couple guys that are going to have to be sitting there and wait for the second night. We're going to have to have a talk about this draft being a two night thing and you not (laughs) actually being here for it, which means my ass got to do a lot more work. That's a story. And that's a conversation for another day. KP. But here's the thing, KP. Atlanta has the number one pick for those who are unaware. The Hawks have the number one pick. They rose from the ashes. They still have Trey Young and DeJounte Murray. But somehow, the projected number one, Alex Saar, does not want to go there. He's refused to work out for the Hawks. Can you give me a little bit more behind that? I mean, I don't blame him. I mean, if you have that sort of wiggle room, and especially when you're not the overall number one consensus pick. We saw this with Jaden Ivey as well, who was the top five pick, refused to work out and talk to Sacramento. And when you're one of three guys that the Hawks are considering at number one, Zachary Richache, the 6'8", 6'9", wing out of France, Donovan Clinton, the 7'2", center out of UConn, who was, you know, the anchor in the paint, uh, you you have that sort of wiggle room to be like, no, we, if, of all places, Washington is where we want to go. That's our preferred destination I think Alex sees himself more as that hybrid for not someone that has to come in and and, de- and is going to be dependent on being that starting center. And so just with his European play style and be able to have the freedom to play more outside along the perimeter and the pick and pop, I think that's why he's kind of favoring number two at Washington. And I don't even think the Hawks care. Like, I think that, that was kind of like, all right, well, this makes our decision a little easier. It's either going to be Risha Shea, Clinton, or a trade somehow, some way with the Spurs. I was going to ask, is a trade for number one, do you think it's going to be a lot of like top five, top 10 trades because there isn't this bona fide, you know, can't miss talent? I think the only trade that is going to be entertained at number one is with the Spurs. So they can try to get back some of those picks in next year's draft that they lost when they traded DeJounte Murray. That would be the only trade that makes sense for the Hawks at number one. I think there are going to be some teams. If they go with Zachary Richache and Donovan Clinton falls to Detroit at five, you might see Memphis uh, try to creep up and try to grab him. Even maybe maybe Portland uh, at seven to try to trade up and grab Donovan Clinton. Uh, So we could see those sort of iterations or just trade swaps. I don't know. I think it all just depends on how much the Spurs, if they love Zachary Richache, what they're willing to give up, especially when we all know what's coming in the next couple drafts 
Cooper Flag, Ace Bailey, Nolan Traore. I know you know all these names, Vinny. Just all kidding. of them. All of them. <laughs> I'm, I, look, I, look, I know the next lightning rod for basketball. If y'all think Caitlin Clark is a lightning rod, let me introduce you to Cooper Flag. Maybe it's going to be going back to 1992. We're going to see all of the... <laughs> All of the takes. It's going to be like Christian Leitner all over again. No, I know Cooper Flag. Now, the rest of those guys, I don't know, but I know Cooper Flag. <laughs> I know. Well, Cooper is the, I, listen, he's going to Duke from Maine, 6'9", sort of hybrid point forward, amazing rim protector. He's going to be a lot of fun to watch and the projected number one pick in next year's draft. We're getting way ahead of ourselves, though. Yes, we are. Just a little bit. Now, <laughs> you brought up the trade at five. This is the bane of my existence, considering <laughs> this is my market. And they had 14 wins. And I've been looking at the mocks, and the mocks have had a name that does not seem to make sense. And I can barely pronounce it. Uh, it's Buzekis? Modest, Modest, no, Modest Buzelis. Uh, Buzelis, he played, I'm sorry, yes. not, yeah, sorry about that. He uh, he played, that's okay. That's why I'm here on the crash course. We're, we're going through this together. It's fine. Uh, Modest played one year with the G League Ignite, 6'9", really athletic forward. Uh, he went on the record last week and said, if I had shot the ball better for the G League Ignite, I'd be a lock at number one. Well, guess what? You didn't shoot the ball well. You shot under 30%. And he wasn't a great shooter in high school. He was one of the top players coming out of high school as well. But what he does possess in terms of upside is kind of that floor spacer. I think his defense got a lot better. His motor got a lot better. I, he showed up for the G League at night, had already put on 20 pounds of muscle. So he's very serious about being an NBA pro and a long-term NBA pro. I think that's why they like him at his upside. The thing that's going to be interesting, though, is if Donovan Clinton is sitting there at five, and I actually have Detroit taking him in my latest mock draft heading into the draft, it's going to be hard to pass up on a, I think, starting center who's going to have a very long NBA career. So do you take Donovan Clinton, go into free agency, find a wing, find a shooter? I think you can find more of that in free agency than a seven foot two, runs the floor very well, elite rim protector. You can move Isaiah Stewart out and put Donovan Clinton and Jalen Duran in the front court together. I think that's a step in the right direction. And then you can go hunting and free agency for some shooters. Yeah, I'm, I'm still not sure exactly what to do with Jalen Durham because he's so athletic, but he doesn't defend and doesn't protect the realm. Uh, I got I got questions. I still think there's a lot there, but I, I saw some steps back this year. But I think a lot of people in Detroit took a step back last year because, you know, the coaching wasn't too great. And they played Killian Hayes for two thirds of the season. But that's a, that, that's a story for another day. That's a frustration for another day. Now. You mentioned, you haven't mentioned, LeBron James Jr., a.k.a. Bronny James. And it looks like the Lakers are going to take him. He's been refusing workouts. I think he's only worked out for Phoenix and the Lakers, correct? Now, yes. does, does this feel like the beginning of some level of trend? Like beyond Bronny James, the whole Bronny James conversation we've, we've exhausted, right? But it feels like, KP, this is going to be the start of kids with familiar last names and parents who we know and have seen for years. This just feels like the start of a trend, right? Yeah, there's two, there's two players in this year's draft, Devin Carter, whose dad is an assistant for the Memphis Grizzlies. And also Bronny James, obviously his son or his dad is LeBron James. The wave that's coming in the next few years, you got Cameron and Caden Boozer that are going to be in 2026. Next year, we have Dylan Harper, DJ Wagner, I can't even think off the top of my head some of the other players that are going to be coming and they're legacy kids. And then further down, you got Gilbert Arenas's and Taj Ariza's sons. So these are all players that are being projected high in high school and are already doing, you know, things that their their dads didn't necessarily do at the high school level. So the legacy of these sons to fathers has been really interesting for me to cover. Kyan Anthony is another name. Yeah. Uh, Justin Pippen, who's going to Michigan next year, is another name because I get to see these these great players, Carmelo, LeBron, uh, Scotty Pippen, show up to the gym and they're just dads. They're AAU dads. They're sometimes coaching their sons. And it's a fun dynamic to see these kids really pay attention when these great players are speaking. So, you know, I, I know Tom Haverstraw wrote a story about the output of legacy kids far exceeding their draft stock. 
if Bronny goes at 55, I think he 100% could exceed that draft stock. You know, he was a shell of himself at USC. I don't want to hear about his stats. This this guy had car- this kid had cardiac arrest, underwent heart surgery, and then was back on the court three, four months later. So that alone is just unheard of. It's extraordinary to see. So I think Bronny is going to be a good long-term pro. He has a high IQ. He understands the game. He's going to be patient with his development. He uh, longer wingspan than people think. He's got great size, not in terms of height. He's only about 6'2", 6'3", maybe, um, but understands the game, understands the PNR. We saw a little bit of a floater in the lane during the five-on-five scrimmages. And uh, he he's a player that guys like to play with. He's not selfish. He's not, you know, he doesn't come in with a big ego. And uh, I think maybe we're two years removed from seeing him being very productive and being able to contribute to an NBA team. But he could be that role player that teams want, you know, in a, in a two guard somewhere down the road. Yeah, the size thing is is one of those things that get to me because I think he measured at six one and three quarters without shoes, which doesn't really matter because you're playing basketball in shoes anyway. I never understood the whole what do you what is your height register when you don't have shoes on? Do you hoop with shoes on? Do you hoop with shoes off? All right, cool, whatever, right? <laughs> right now you have a hot take here because everybody looks at Zach Eady. And I think it's probably you know recency bias and the fact that you don't know, but so many of these kids in this draft. It feels like a lot of people are higher on Zach Eady than you are, and you have a take on such a thing. So I'm just going to give you the floor. I'll say this. I mean, I have come around a little bit on Zach Eady. For the longest time, it was, if I have 58 picks, he's not even 58th on my board. But going back and watching film and looking at this draft, this is the perfect draft for him. This is the perfect draft for a player like Zach Eady in terms of if you are a team in that first round, And you want that secondary anchor in the defense. You want someone who guards are going to question driving the paint when they see a seven foot four, seven foot five, 300 pound center there in the paint. You know, that's that's where you're going to get value from Zach Eady. Not necessarily as a franchise center. I don't think so. I think teams that a team that drafts them knows that he's going to have to lead the secondary unit, kind of be that relief center around that 10 to 15 minute range in a game. Because like I said, he's 7'5", 300 pounds. You have to think of durability in an 82 game season, right? So he's not going to be out there playing 30 plus minutes. Now, does that warrant a lottery pick? Absolutely not. I'm hearing that he could go as high as 14 to Portland, which is insane to me. And you look at the mess that Portland has there. They drafted Scoot Henderson. He took about three quarters of the year to figure it out and and adjust to the pace. I don't know how well he's fitting in with Anthony Simons and Shaden Sharp in the backcourt. You trade away Damian Lillard. You get DeAndre Ayton. You guys can't even get him a bed to sleep on. He's sleeping on an air mattress. Then you get Drew Holiday in the trade, and you trade him to Boston for a championship team. He was the missing piece, one of the missing pieces for that championship team. So... You guys are going to draft, Portland is going to draft Zach Eady and try to make it work, try to make him be the anchor in the defense. That is a fireable offense. And I think if they do do that a year from now, we're going to be some, we're going to be seeing some changes in the front office. So are you saying he's Boban Marjanovic? Yes. Okay, cool. You say he's Boban. Uh, right. I okay, and I think what people are going to make me my words at summer league because if we remember, Taco Fall was the darling of summer league. Summer league is a poor man's AAU NBA tournament. So I do think Zach Eady is going to come into summer league and totally put on a show, and people are going to be so excited. You are out of your mind if you think that Scoot Henderson is going to wait for Zach Eady to run down the floor to get into a PNR set or any guard for that matter. And he's going to be hunted in the pick and roll defensively the entire time he's on the court. There's defense at three seconds. He can't just camp out in the lane like he did four years in college. And you watch the national championship, and that's all the perimeter players did. They tried to get him in mismatched situations. And people look, oh, well, he had 37 out of their 60 points. His offensively, like, you can take the liabilities defensively. I don't think you can in the spacing in the NBA. And that's why I wouldn't touch him, but I'm being told that he won't be on the board past 20. 
it's going to be an interesting night. Now, there's three <laughs> names. It's not on the rundown, but I thought of this uh, this morning before we came on. Three names of guys who I believed at various points were very high on people's mock drafts through the college season, through the G League Ignite season. So I'm going to throw them out to you and see what you think. Ron Holland. Yeah. Rob Dillingham. Yeah. Reed Shepard. Yes. Uh, what do you think we'll about each, with- of those, each of those guys? Go ahead. We'll start with Ron Holland. I mean, he's kind of falling a little bit. I think come draft night, he does stay at the back end of the lottery, but he was a little, well, not a little, a lot uh, <laughs> turnover prone during his Ignite season. And they, listen, the games were so lopsided. Somebody had to do something to score points. He can do a lot with the ball in his hands, but going into a situation, I think teams were more looking for his off ball production because he's not necessarily going to come in and be that guy. I don't think teams want him to be that guy. So defensively, he averaged two point two and a half steals per game in the G League, which is very, very good. His size, how shifty he is, left-handed, loves to get downhill, dynamic, explosive in transition. That's what's going to keep him, I think, at the back end of the lottery. Outside shooting, not great. Turnovers, not great. The fact that he has to have the ball in his hands to be productive, not great. But... There's, he's still young. He's still 19. That's what we always have to look at these guys. There's still some time for growth and improvement. Rob Dillingham. This is a player. We talk about measurements at the combine. He came in at six, one and a half and 164 pounds. This is 14 pounds lighter than what he was listed at Kentucky coming off the bench, leading the secondary unit along Reed Shepard. So the fact that he skipped agility, didn't go through shooting, skipped his pro day, citing his sore ankle, the very last minute he got in to work out with teams, Clutch still thinks he's going to be there anywhere from 8 to 12. I'm not so sure. I think teams are going to go back and look at his limited foot speed defensively, especially that Oakland game where Golke got off 11 threes or whatever it was, nine threes. And, and just take pause. And so I think he might be falling outside the lottery because we're seeing other guards like Bub Carrington and Devin Carter rise. Reed Shepard is the only one that I think is going to be a top five lock. I have him going number three to Houston. He's kind of that, that uh, you know, just does, every, does all the little things really well. And he's the best shooter in this draft class. He shot 52% on three and a half attempts per game coming off the bench at Kentucky. And he's just a smart player. Is he? Does he have limited size at 6'2"? Yes, but he's also 20 pounds hot, heavier than uh, Rob Dillingham. And he also it was is way more athletic than we thought, recording a 42-inch Max Bird at the Combine, tied for the highest out of the entire group. So Reed Shepard, lock in the top five. Uh, Ron Holland, back half of the lottery. Rob Dillingham, possibly falling outside the lottery. KP, you just gave us a whole lot of information. (laughs) Don't forget, guys, to check out KP's final mock draft, which should be coming out at some point. By the time, if you're hearing this podcast, it is probably out. Don't forget, Christian Peak last year was the one person on this podcast and then many others saying, y'all, there's this guy that Miami just drafted. I just see him in the gym. His name is Jaime Jaquez Jr., I think you know how to pronounce his name by that point. You're like, this kid is going to be good. And we're like, oh, yeah, he looks like the Pringles chip guy. And he turned out to be actually pretty good. So, KP, really appreciate you. Thanks so much. And uh, try to get some sleep between now and Wednesday. Yes. Thanks, Vinny. Appreciate you. We're going to pause for a minute, pay some bills. And then we'll be right back with a very interesting conversation that I had recently with Tom Haverstrow about Michael Jordan's 1988 Defensive Player of the Year Award. You're listening to The Good Word here on Yahoo Sports. Tom, you released an article on Yahoo Sports that went deep into the 1987-88 Defensive Player of the Year conversation. That award went to Michael Jordan. He Mm. won MVP and Defensive Player of the Year that year for the Bulls. It was like groundbreaking in a way because... He has such an inordinate amount of steals and blocks. And what you've come up with in terms of how games were scored back then by scorekeepers home and road, what it seems that there was an inordinate difference, a vast difference between steals and blocks at home Mm -hmm. and steals and blocks on the road. So before we even get to that, what brought you to what was the impetus for this piece? Yeah, this isn't just I'm doing a drive by on uh, Michael Jordan's career. That is not what I'm doing here. This is I was fascinated by the Jaron Jackson story last year. Do you remember that Jaron Jackson story that came up Man, it was gone before it even arrived was 
uh, a Reddit poster was accusing Jaron Jackson Jr. of being the beneficiary of home cooked stats. Basically, his Defensive Player of the Year candidacy was invalid because he had huge home road discrepancies and that the Memphis Grizzlies stat keeper was basically gifting him blocks and steals. uh, And basically, his candidacy was a fraud. That turned out to be a false alarm. And that story fizzled in record time because today we have the ability, Vinny, to look at all the blocks within like 10 seconds. We can get pull up the video, whether it's Synergy or Second Spectrum or on NBA.com and watch them in like an hour. And people like Kevin O'Connor, uh, there were national analysts that within the hours of that story breaking, we could, we could actually truth squad that story. But 1988, if we look at the home road discrepancy between Michael Jordan's block and steal rates at the home arena at Chicago Stadium versus on the road, it is the largest gap of any Defensive Player of the Year award winner in NBA history. So since 1983, when the Defensive Player of the Year award was uh, initially handed out, I looked at home road splits, blocks and steals, because those things are highly influenced by this, the home stat keeper. And it is a... I guess you would say a subjective stat is when there's a a loose ball, when a guy tips a ball and then another guy recovers it, who do you give the steal to? It's not totally clear in the, in the rule book. And a lot of times the star player will get the benefit of the doubt there. And Michael Jordan's 88 season had the largest gap between the home rate and the road rate. And all of that is like, cool. Like that might be just statistical, uh, circumstance. But then I talked to a stack keeper for Pablo Torre Finds Out, the show over on Metal Arc Media. With Pablo Torre, I reported out a story with a former stack keeper with the Grizzlies. And in the late 90s, with the, with the Vancouver Grizzlies as the expansion team, he admitted to inflating home stats for the Vancouver Grizzlies. This is the Bryant Reeves Big Country Vancouver Grizzlies. This is the Sharif Abdul Rahim yep, yep. Vancouver Grizzlies and he said on the record that it was kind of it was part of the league culture. That uh he went to a stat keeping convention in Detroit and they all got together and he came away from that meeting understanding that there was a power of the star treatment. And so he felt like, you know, I can do this. I can give the benefit of the doubt to Sharif Abdul-Rahim, whose home road splits were crazy in the blocks and steel columns. And so we had a stack keeper was like, yeah, homer bias. It's a real thing. And then you see Michael Jordan's crazy home road splits in the blocks and steals column for the, that year. And so I started digging. And that's how I got on to this journey of investigating the 88 depoy that I think you tell me. I think would be like the most important defensive player of the year in NBA history. Is it not? I, I guess, is it under the premise that that is the thing that Michael Jordan has that LeBron James does not? Or Kareem or Kobe or Wilt or you name it. Like the, the goat conversation is going to start with Michael Jordan about 6 and 0. Like if you go with the goat conversation about Michael Jordan, you can talk about his scoring titles fine. You can talk about his all defense teams fine. It's going to start with 6 and 0. But right behind that, you hear it from Stephen A or Jalen Rose or whomever is LeBron James doesn't have a defensive player of the year award. Michael Jordan does. And so when we look at it through the prism of the differentiator in the goat conversation or just in the ad nauseum, breathless debate about who's the greatest of all time in that conversation is that 88 defensive player of the year. And so that's why I think it is a huge award given out to Michael Jordan. And if it's not as valid as we thought, that's a story. I See, for me, I don't look at it that way. I understand the point of, of saying it's the most important defensive player of the year award because of when you're talking about matching up accolades and everything else, this is to me, I don't say eye test because Michael Jordan, clearly, especially from your story, 
was pissed that he didn't win it in 87 when Michael Cooper won the award, right? Mm -hmm. And Michael Jordan, being a competitive cycle that he was, was like, okay, I'm going to win this award and led the league in steals by an, an ab abnormous rate and almost averaged two blocks a game, right? Which is really <laughs> wild for a guard. Like, 1.6 blocks per game for a guard. Yeah, Crazy. They're, they're two block, like, and, and this is after a year where he averaged nearly three steals and averaged a block and a half, right? And didn't win defensive player of the year. So, so much of this is want to. So much of winning a defensive player of the year award is want to. You saw it with Marcus Smart. You saw it with Gary Payton. You saw it, especially as a guard. It's really hard to do that because defending at the rim and rebounding is such a thing that we see that is so quantifiable. You know what I mean? It's a big man's award. It's a Hakeem, a David Robinson, a generational defender, a Dennis Rodman, a Ben Wallace, a Takemi Mutombo. It's that type of award. Michael winning it in the 88 is an anomaly, right? It's an extreme anomaly. I would also venture, and I wasn't, I'm trying to get into the gold argument of it is, it doesn't do anything for me per se because he was probably the best perimeter defender in the league for a decade. Regardless of what the blocks and steals said, he was a dude you didn't want in front of you. And he, don't get me wrong, he got torched, but he was just a dude you didn't want in front of him. One thing I found really fascinating in reading your article was that there was one game against the Hawks where Atlanta had 10 turnovers, and all 10 turnovers were charged to Chicago Bulls steals. Not Michael Jordan steals, but 10 Chicago Bulls steals. And that is damn near impossible for a team to have <laughs> yeah. 10 turnovers yeah. and not one of them just be, oh, I dribbled the ball off my foot. You know what I mean? Or, you know, that sort of 24 thing. 24-second like, violation. 24-second, yeah, sec or yeah any, anything, right? So how... How much of an anomaly do you think this entire thing was? Or how how do I put this? Intellectually dishonest do you think this thing is? Well, I wanted to make sure I was being fair here and wanted to look at like Michael Jordan versus his peers. Did they have a statistical difference in the blocks and steals as large as Michael? Was this just like common practice around the league that Michael Jordan had 80% higher rate? of blocks and steals on the, at home than on the road. Like he averaged four steals a game at home in that 88 season. And it was almost half that on the road. Uh, same with his block rate. So it was about double at home than on the road. And looking at it, no other player in that year um, had nearly the same rates of inflation home road. There was inflation, no doubt. And we should expect that. Like players play better at home. Um, and in a world in which stat keepers aren't facing the ridicule of social media, where if you do give a, a generous stat to someone, it's not going to be flagged and ridiculed on Twitter within seconds. Like Worldwide Wild would have that in 1988 uh, routinely if there was right. just like phantom steals being handed out like candy. So I looked into that statistically. Uh, what you see is that Michael Jordan had a larger bump in inflation on his stats than anybody in that era. And what's also interesting is not just the statistics. Like you said, we had to go look at the film. I wanted to get my hands on game film, which is very hard to come by. But my friend in Latvia, who is a, a NBA historian, who's also a basketball executive in Latvia, Reynas Latsis, I came across him because he did a bunch of uh, audits on Nick Van Exel's game when he had 23 assists. He watched that game. And by the way, that was scored by the Vancouver Grizzlies uh, <laughs> stat keeper. Um, he had like 15 assists actually in that game. Uh, Shaq had a 15 block game. He watched that film it was more like 10. And so he's doing this uh, historically. And I was like, do you have any Michael Jordan games when he had a bunch of steals or blocks in that season and he's like hold on i'm part of this like underground trading network of european nba fans that this is the only way we can watch old school nba because we, we we didn't get cbs we didn't get these uh national tv games so we all hoarded these vhs tapes and watched our favorite players let me let me come back so he gives me the five tapes and we watch five tapes start to finish and that Atlanta Hawks game was one of them that we were like, what's going on here? 10 turnovers, 10 steals. So no 24 seconds, no charges. 
where you can't attribute that turnover to a defender as a steal. No passes out of bounds, no dribbling off your foot. And it turns out, yeah, it wasn't legit that there were errors in that game. And there was a surplus of steals that seemed to be given and allocated to Michael Jordan. And as we watched more tapes, Vinny, we saw, we saw a pattern where if a guy was going up for a layup and Horace Grant blocked the shot, but the referee called a foul, Horace Grant wouldn't get the block. It was just a foul. We know that that's not supposed to be a block and a foul call. Right, right. But when Michael Jordan did the same thing where he contested a shot that was called a foul on Michael Jordan and it looked like a block, he had an excess of blocks in that game. And the problem is we don't have play-by-play data. So we can't be like, oh, on that play at 154 in the second quarter when Michael Jordan was called for a foul, was he also called for a block? What we can say is that the box score we could watch the game be like, oh, here's how many blocks we saw and here's how many blocks were actually in the box score. And more often than not, Michael Jordan was the beneficiary of excess blocks that were unaccounted for in the viewing of the game. Same with the steals. And so at the end of those five games, Vinny, there were 23 steals in the box score in those five games for Michael Jordan. And by watching the game independently, the scorekeeper and I, we saw eight. Eight steals for Michael Jordan in those five games, 1.6 per game. And that is 15 fewer than the box score said he had. And so the pattern we saw was when you go back and watch Vinny, you would see when Michael Jordan batted the ball away from Joe Dumars and it went out of bounds and the Pistons got the ball back, that would be an instance that Michael Jordan may have possibly have gotten a steal when a deflection was considered a steal or when, hey, uh, Kevin Willis is laying out Michael Jordan on a screen. Kevin Willis gets called for an offensive foul on the screen, moving screen. Michael Jordan might be given a steal in that case, even though that's not by the rule, a steal. These are moments in the game where we're like, man, did they really give Michael a steal on that play? Because you can't find it anywhere else. By the book, there were eight steals, and yet he had 23 steals in those five games. So it wasn't enough for me to just go by the stats and be like, yeah, he had the largest inflation of home road for any Depoy winner in NBA history. I had to watch the film, and in the five games that I watched, it was pretty clear to me that something was going on. Well. You can't quite do that now because we got DraftKings and all these other different things. And we got people who uh, are under indictment for, you know, issues like this. And that's why guys are banned. Not saying that there's anything yeah. nefarious to that point happening back then. I'm just saying this is the reason why stats have to be looked at with a lot more scrutiny now. And I just think in time, everything improves. There's a lot more of a close eye being looked at. You can probably sure you can go back and look at Russell's rebounds and Chamberlain's rebounds. I'm not saying that Chamberlain's hundred points. This wasn't a hundred points. I'm just saying, I'm definitely saying that John Stockton got probably a thousand more assists than he should have though. That is Tom Haver show. Ladies and gentlemen, go read that article right here on Yahoo sports. Appreciate your time. You got it. Vinny.